Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 107 of the Titan Forge podcast. I'm Dratnos, joined by Trell and Tettles as always, and this week's Augers. special guests are Growl, aka Yummy TV, and Yoda TV, aka Yoda. Um, welcome, both of you, to our show. Hello, friends. You didn't even introduce Junkrat. Junkrat's here, too. Yeah, Junkrat <laughs> lurking down there in the corner as well. Um, so, for those who don't know, Growl, do you prefer Growl or are you going by Yummy TV now? now? Is that the plan? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. It's like, you know how some streamers have like their their stream persona and then their real name? I'm like that except for I just don't even want to have a real name. So my real name will just be one of my character names. Okay. And then my stream is you, me, I guess. Okay. You, Dude, me. whenever we were casting over your guys' games, I, I'm pretty sure that we just bounced around and yeah, called we just you alternated. both names. Just, it was just like every single time it was just both names. It was like, okay, hold on. Uh, and then Yoda as well. So the two of you are players on Team Incarnation, MDI team, uh, that people may know from last weekend of the MDI. Here was the bracket of the uh, MDI. This is the upper bracket. And you'll notice Incarnation, the team that took out Echo, not once, but twice uh, to win that entire weekend. So uh, big congratulations to both of you. And that is a huge reason for why we are so excited to have you on the show this week. Otherwise, we wouldn't be that interested. Otherwise, yeah. Fun. And if, yeah. if you guys lose to Echo, you know, don't care. Uh, you're dead to us. <laughs> well, not that don't care. <laughs> well, I'm glad we won then. <laughs> that, I mean, that was my main motivation for winning. I'm just like, I really want to be on the Titan Forge podcast again. I really, that was just pulsing through my veins in those matches. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, so obviously just an incredible accomplishment, you know, Echo, such a such an incredible team. Uh, and so being able to to win that upper, the, the first 2-0 against them was, I mean, just shocking for uh, for most people to see. And then cementing it with the, the finals victory in three very, very close games. We will talk all about that run, though. That will be one of our main topics for this week. What do you got, Tuttles? Is it true that Yoda is the only person to beat Meth uh, Methody you slash Echo not once but twice in the same tournament, uh, ever in a, in a finals. <laughs> oh, uh, wait, I guess maybe Perplex, no, Perplex has probably done it. So yeah, Perplex, Perplex has, has, has to have done it. Yeah, I, maybe I do believe though that Incarnation are currently the only team with a winning lifetime record against Echo. <laughs> All right, well, that's probably we'll, true. we'll have to consult the MDI historians on that one, but. Uh, definitely a, a, regardless, incredibly impressive feat. Uh, for those who are MDI followers, we have, this. Is, so this was the three group stages, and actually upsets in all three groups. None as big as the Incarnation Echo upset, uh, but none of this second row teams actually advanced out of their groups, even though they were all, you know, second rated in their, in their groups. It was the third, uh, third highest seed in each group that instead took one of those top two spots. So it was a pretty exciting MDI, all things considered. I think we got extremely fortunate as well to see just the, like the, the quality of the games between Echo and Incarnation in particular were so great. Um, so if you missed that, they're all in the Warcraft YouTube. You can go back and, and watch some of those matches. That one in particular is really good. And uh, Dorky, tank for your group, uh, for your team, uploaded the runs with voice comms as well. Uh, and those are really a, a delight to i've i've listened to you guys like when you at the end of the the last sanguine depths like four times now it's a great yeah there's there is a lot of moments i mean not to spoil the moments but if you've seen the matches you know some of the moments that i'm talking about with either end of matches or specific mini boss happenings and yeah i'm sure a lot of people would be interested i think even during the cast someone was like wow i wonder what their comms were like during this just because yeah it was it's a it's a treat to watch Dorky play as well. He's such a sick player. Yeah, I um, I don't know, some something about uh about your group though has has worked or something about your team, because all this is your first time playing together, in an MDI at all, and in fact four of the five of you had never played in a single MDI, uh, before at all three. either. Three, three, three. Cryptics. Yeah, Cryptics has played. Cryptics oh, right, had okay. done one. Yeah. yeah. All right. So still. A uh, huge amount of, of fresh faces, um, and so to put up a performance like that is just incredibly impressive. Um, real quick, though, before we get started, I guess let's talk a little bit about 
uh, what's going on on the live servers this week? Because we're on like back to back push week. Are you guys playing? You guys pushing keys on the live servers this week at all? Yeah, Yoda. Are we pushing live keys this week? What are we up to? Uh, our team basically plays when Dorky logs in, and that hasn't been the last two days. So I think he's taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> Yoda's on the Final Fantasy grind. I've been playing Diablo 2 Remastered today. I mean, I'm down to play, but it's kind of like, you know, we've been playing so much that. But I, I hope we at least get some a few days in this weekend to play. A couple of drops of IO just to Yeah, just, just, to tide just you one over. little hit. One yeah. hit just to keep me going. <laughs> uh, Trell, you watched the MDI as well. As, as somebody who's who played in some previous ones, I know you were really... You, like, came back because you'd been on your on your adventure safari to the to the american outback <laughs> um and then watch the matches afterwards how did you how did you enjoy you know seeing the the mdi this time around oh that was so awesome like seeing a, a new formed team for the mdi which is incarnation technically even though they're all really good players it's still a new team on the scene to watch them beat echo twice back to back is actually insane like echo has so much experience and obviously they had some mistakes but uh, Team Incarnation had to take so many risks and humongous pulls to keep the momentum going, to, just to keep up. Like that was so impressive. You guys just held it together so well. All right, so let's get started by talking a little bit more about how that weekend worked. Yoda, as the as the resident like MDI veteran, how much of the you know planning and and prep and organizational stuff was on you versus how much did Dorky just do all of it, uh, or you know? Uh, delegated out around the group. What was the what was the process of getting ready for MDI like for you guys? I'd say so. We actually spent a lot of time before the Avix's route, just playing on maps and getting like decent routes set up. I think our team definitely worked the hardest uh, outside of the outside of having the Avix's for that, and that really helped. I think most of the time it was Dorky setting the initial route, and then if there's like some tech or something that he didn't know about, then obviously we'd fill him in. And then he just incorporated it into the route, but mostly it was Dorky playing the stuff. Yeah, so the way that those... worked is oh god. I was gonna say for those who don't know, these guys were actually just in like Growl and Dorky's Discord for sixteen hours a day for like five weeks straight. Just every single time I would click onto that Discord to go do keys with a different group, they're always in like this channel. It's like uh, no streams allowed, only Discord streams, and they were there for just it felt like five weeks just there 16 hours a day it was insane all right yeah, i don't we know about gaming. 16 hours okay we were I feel like you're always there <laughs> 26 we were, hours we were, a day we were, were in there crazy. quite a bit yeah 26 hours a day to be honest um so yeah for the the way that worked is that you had the time trials and then you were placed in group c which had the most time between the time trials and the actual event so but and you only learn about your affixes the weekend of group b playing right uh, so you have like one week of playing with those affixes, and that's the same time you learn the the bracket and everything as well, and like which maps are where. Um, how did you, once that actually all that information came out, how did you end up assigning your time between like the upper bracket uh, and the lower bracket, which you obviously never actually went to? But how much did you you know prep for those matches and those maps and everything? Um, um you can go. Okay, so. We basically decided when we looked at all when we looked at the matches, the two most important matches are going to be our second match of the tournament, which is against Omega Pump, and then we also figured lower finals was going to be the most the other most important match, because the winner if we win lower finals that basically means we qualify, and our main goal was to qualify. So if you look at lower finals in our second match, they both featured Necrotic Wake and I believe Spires. So it was literally two of the maps in both of our most important matches were Necrotic Wake and Spires. So uh, Spires was pretty tame. It was, just, it was like a 19 for it, and it was Raging Explosive. And, you know, Explosive was just a healer affix. So it was pretty it was pretty chill the whole time. Uh, we spent a decent amount of time in there, but most of our time was actually spent in Necrotic Wake. Uh, I believe it was a 21 Tyrannical Wait. Sanguine. <laughs> Uh, you guys didn't it, play that map, right? Yeah, yeah. we didn't play it. We literally, <laughs> literally, I would say, I would say, half of our practice time was in the Sanguine Necrotic Wake, like high Sanguine Tyrannical Necrotic Wake, uh, just really trying to qualify because you know it was game three in our first in our first match against Omega Pump, and in, in our projected second match against Omega Pump, it was game one. So we heavily prepared there, and then obviously we didn't make it there in the first time. We weren't in the lower bracket, so we never played it there. And it was in the grand finals, but Echo banned it. So have our practice time. <laughs> it was into a map we never played. 
That's nuts. Did you guys see Reload play <laughs> Necrotic Wake by chance? Yes. Yes. They yeah. had a... Honestly, okay. Everyone was laughing about their Necrotic Wake, but they went for strats that were really good. It was hard. Necrotic Wake 22 Sanguine is so hard. That's why we... I mean, that's why we were spending so much time in it, because it actually took that much time to perfect, and props to them for trying the strats that they did because they were playing to beat any team and yeah it was hard like yeah. yeah they showed up and in uh had some interesting times but at least what they were going for was like was the same stuff that echo was doing was the same stuff that we were doing i assume omega pump was doing the same stuff so like they were they were playing to win on those maps like they had the same mindset as us where they were like we have to win the lower finals we're gonna be good at necrotic wake and maybe they weren't able to get the consistency down i mean who knows if we had the consistency and see down because we didn't play it either but right yeah i was i was about to ask that what, what did you guys think the chances were that your necrotic wake would like not have a disaster uh if you were like if you if you had to put a percentage chance that it was going to be a clean run uh what would you have said no, i no. i wasn't i've never done an mdi so i had no idea all i knew was how many times in practice that we went into a run and died on the first pull and then went again so before the tournament, I would have said that our chance of timing any dungeon was like very, a lot lower than it realistically was. But I guess we're all just playing to learn and testing stuff out and seeing what can happen. And then when it's actually game time, then it's like, OK, we know the adjustments we have to make and we know how to play safe. So before the tournament, I probably would have said sub 25 percent. But after the tournament, I probably would say like, I mean, we pra we put a lot of time into it. I would say probably between like, I don't know, 60 and 80%. I think we would have had a good run. I mean, we were pretty well practiced. Like we spent a lot of time in there. I, we were all pretty happy with our way. So when you say you targeted the, uh, the Omega Pump matchup in the upper quarterfinals and then the lower finals, right? So your plan is, okay, we're going to beat Omega Pump here, send them to the lower bracket, probably lose to Echo, right? And then we have to win... Uh, the lower finals, you know, we get sent directly to the lower finals where we have to beat them again. Uh, that was the, you know, if, if all the top seeded teams were winning uh, other the other matches that you weren't in, that was what it was going to look like. W was that, you know, was there any uh, any plans of like, okay, what if we lose to a mega pump? You know, do we need to practice these uh, all these ones in the lower bracket more, uh, or was that uh, never something you were considering? So we had, I mean, we had, I think we had at least a decent route for every map except plague fall our plague fall was like what you basically saw in the first day uh it was basically like the normal route and then we added two or three pulls because it's bolstering and then just called it a day because we i think we expected to win the first day with it and then yeah you never the go only back other, there the yeah, only time for... the only other time we see it is upper is upper finals against echo and my philosophy there was we don't have to win upper finals and it's game three anyway so i don't think it's worth putting that much time into it and then, you know, we never we won our finals without even seeing it. So that was pretty epic. That, that was crazy, yeah. <laughs> Bold move, assuming you're going to 2 0 echo. I mean, that worked I, out. <laughs> if you told me it wasn't going to go to a game three, I would have been like, yeah, I, I believe it. But then if you told me how, I would have been like, hang about. <laughs> Run that one by me again. <laughs> well, I think a really important principle in MDI that we came to learn was what is your fastest time if you play clean? And for instance, Echo, I think, like, we. Yeah, we beat Echo, but realistically, their fastest time in those dungeons was better than ours. And no matter how much time, like, we weren't able to spend enough time to make it so we could have, like, a 12-minute hauls or a 12-minute... Whatever they were going to do in those dungeons. So it's not that we we're like oh we're not going to practice them because we can't beat them but our win condition in those games is just to play solid and have a good time and they make mistakes at least in winners finals but in the omega pump match for example our win condition needed to be we need to beat them if they play a clean run like we can't show up to the omega pump games and then we play clean and they play clean and then we lose that was wasn't acceptable for us so that was kind of our goal was we needed our best run to be able to beat their best run and we hope that at some point, our you know when we match up against Echo, our best run will beat their best run too. But obviously, in our our first cup together, we set our sights kind of on it, not the very very top, but close. Yeah, it's interesting because when you when you describe it in those terms, you know, of the five maps you played against Echo, the one where you probably have the closest, you know, if everything goes well, plan to them is maybe theater or maybe yep, the mist. Yep, but the theater yep. is the one you obviously lost by thirteen seconds, but. 
that was re- I mean you were you were firing so cool. on all cylinders there and for those who didn't watch this you guys broke out this uh, arms warrior prop paladin comp that were two specs that had had until that point not been played in this MDI season at all um, how did you know how how much was theater part of your planning process and how did you exactly come to this comp as your plan um, I think a lot of the planning, so like Yoda said, we did a lot of practice early on with just learning routes for dungeons. So once we got the affixes, there were some dungeons where we really needed to make adjustments. For example, Plaguefall Bolstering, we decided this is going to be too hard. We're just going to simplify our old route. Or Sanguine Necrotic Wake, where we're like, we just really need to practice this and have a good route and plan and make this work. And Theater was a dungeon where whatever we were doing was just fine. Like uh, it was like a 20 necrotic quaking, I want to say, or something. So it was something spiteful. where it, it uh, spiteful. Yeah. So it didn't affect our theater route. We did. We honestly didn't play it too much during the week, but we had, it was a route that we had practiced previously. We had practiced it a lot. I think the idea behind the theater, maybe Yoda can, can fill in, but we, we thought that arms warrior was really strong and we wanted to play arms warrior in that dungeon. And then if we're, Playing Arms Warrior, you know, you lose a lot of value on the tank to play, you know, Prot because you're not getting that battle shout. So it's like, well, what other tank can we play that does a lot of damage? And we we settled on Prot Paladin because, like, Demon Hunter didn't really get a lot of benefit because of, like, we don't have that much magic damage and neither did yeah. Prot Warrior. Okay. I think I'm Prot Paladin was a really good choice there, honestly. And you still got the spell reflect value out of the the last boss. That was really important. Honestly, like the thirteen second difference, them catching you on the last boss. I think they pulled like what twenty seconds after or something. It was it was quite a bit. Uh, I believe I think like we thirty seconds maybe something like that. Yeah, we I think we were at like fifty percent and they hadn't pulled yet. I think, and then they just zoomed past us. It was actually crazy. They yeah, that was they, crazy. They got so much damage by actually not killing those adds at the very beginning of the fight, or at the very beginning of the dungeon. They only pulled the bullhorn into the first boss, so then they were able to just like murder Mordretha with the with the trash at the end, and it just allowed them to have stupid amounts of single target. Plus, they had lust, I think, as well. Yeah, they had yeah. lust. Sub rogue is really good. Well, another thing that happened to us that was kind of small was we were lusting Zav pretty consistently during practice, and a lot of that was just. I drop Ashen and blast him, but eventually we got so refined with the route that we didn't even have Ashen on pull for that, and we kind of didn't really shore up exactly how we wanted. Like, I'm not so sure if our Lust on Zab was the right move if we have all the cooldowns, because that was part of the reason they caught up, too, is they weren't really as far behind as you thought because they had the Lust and we didn't, so I'm not really... We didn't really have a good answer. There wasn't really a... You know, we were still kind of working that out, but yeah, it was... It was unfortunate. We did have a little scuff at the end, but they also had a mistake in the the gore chop wing too. So it's I, I'm not sure if if we would have played perfect and they would have played perfect. It would have been really close, like within seconds for sure. How much did that happen to you guys during uh like during the refinement process where a cooldown that you just have been doing a hundred attempts on eventually just gets bricked because you've gotten so fast? at the stuff that comes before it that is no longer up and how did you guys have to did you guys learn to adjust to all that stuff a lot it happened a lot it's kind of hard because we like that happens but then you also get better at the pulls so for example inspires that would happen where we got really good with doing the first boss with all the trash and then we had that one really big pull with the birds and the cats and all that stuff that we would start to lose cooldowns for that because they wouldn't be up but then as we got better at doing that pull, then it was like, well, we don't necessarily need these cooldowns. And they kind of just, things kind of slide together, but yeah, it definitely happens. At some point, I don't know if you guys notice on the broadcast, but I actually ran the the Venthyr Lego Inspires. Yeah. Just because we were yeah. going so fast eventually that we didn't have Ashen for all the pulls that we needed. Like if you noticed the omega pump route they did they ashen the mini boss and then they ended up having to do those hurlers at the very end after the third boss because they don't have any of their cooldowns up because it's like three and a half minutes or whatever and so they have it, it seems like it's a waste of time but they have to do it because they can't fight the angels with no cooldowns anyway so that was the spot where we literally were just like well i'm just gonna run the ash and lego and it's just gonna reduce the cd and then we're gonna call it a day and we won't lose any uses Whereas Echo, like, I think Echo played Spires and they just only got three Ashens in the dungeon because they were going so fast. 
Yeah, it's a cool kind of problem solving that I think your team, one of the cool things to watch about your team was that you guys were actually like considering all these weird answers to questions uh, that other, you know, it's not just in like the default meta MDI comp, right? Where it's just like, oh, you know, what if we, what, how, how do we play Prop Paladin in here? You know, how do we, okay, how do we sort all this stuff out? Um, and, you know, considering all the, all the different legendaries that you have access to. Um, did you guys see the Real Esports Mage? I don't know, Yoda, I, I, I don't know how much Frost Mage you play, Yoda, but uh, the Real Esports Frost Mage actually was playing like the Night Fae Legendary and that looked really good to me. I don't know if you yeah, have we had a, an we had, we had an We had an internal team discussion and I also spoke with a few other mages about it and our consensus was that this Legendary is only good if you want to look good on the meter, but not good for speed. Okay, well... Interesting. I was wondering about that because it's like pure AoE, right? That that legend. Oh, I wouldn't say pure pure AoE because it gives you stats, right? So yeah, true. I mean, the stats are still good on single target, but freezing wind is such a huge gain on single on like prior or single target that uh, it's like it's much better unless you only care about damage to everything. All right. Yeah. Well, because the the alternative one is the one where you get the fingers of frosts from your frozen orb, right? Yeah. But like the theory, Crystal I think fragments. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. It's not the oh, most no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's, it's freezing. Freezing winds is the one that most of them play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're um, right. But like the, in some of those dungeons, there's just trash on all the bosses anyway, so you already have like infinite fingers. I guess is the idea off of your. Oh no, board. it doesn't give you fingers. It gives you, it gives you lances. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or lance rocks. Wait, I don't. I actually don't know. I think that is the fingers, but either way. No, no, no you're, you're right. Yeah. No, no, no. You're right. Rocks. You're right. It's called fingers. Never mind. Yeah. I thought it was called. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I thought I thought it was pretty cool, but if it's just good on the meters, I mean, part of the reason I thought it looked cool was because it looked so good on the meters. Um, was the, <laughs> this thing? But uh, fair enough. Um, Either way, it was a lot of AOE. That fr every frost mage burst I saw was like. Yeah, we noticed he, he he was actually like rinsing Jinji on the meters when they yeah. when they had that match. Yeah, but, uh, I would say I would I would I, would, I did notice that Echo caught them on almost every boss. Like they were had mm -hmm. a faster boss kill time every time. Definitely true. Echo, I mean, Echo just seems like they always, they always just kill the boss thirty percent faster than it seems possible. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually kind of crazy. Every time, every time we do a fight, a boss fight, Dorky just like links us an Echo bot and says, "How come they're twenty seconds faster?" And then he just looks at all their damage and it's all higher than ours. And we're like, "Well, I don't, I don't know what to do about this." <laughs> well, this is like whatever a Dorky would like uh, Xing Chen's uh, vod and be like, "Yo, Mage, why are you not doing Xing Chen damage? This is dumb." Yeah, I like how Yoda phrased it as we had an internal discussion, but I'm pretty sure our internal discussion was was Dorky just like, yo, Cryptic, you see that guy running that knife a Lego? That guy's blasting. Why don't you do that damage? Why don't you run that knife a Lego? Are you going to blast like him? Just try it. That was that was pretty much our uh, our internal discussion for that. <laughs> oh, Okay, also for internal discussions, can you tell us about the lore behind the Dorky Bears Twitch page real quick? Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, so, so, so you go, you go ahead. Okay, so Dorky, beforehand, Dorky was like, "Hey, you guys should all let's all make private Twitch channels for uh, so we can upload vods and look at each other's POVs." And I was like, "Okay, uh, great idea." And then you know, I gave him mine. His prize has a name that I'm not going to repeat, and is you won't find just by typing Yoda into the search bar. And then <laughs> uh, eventually, Dorky links us his links us a clip from his channel, and it's just Dorky Bear Z. And then we then we're like. You know, don't you think this is a little like easy to find? And he was like, "No, no, no, no one will ever look for it." Then we look at the clips, and there's just clips from Dorky's fans. One of the clips is huge pull, and it's like our top secret Hall's first pull, just like you know, clip for the general <laughs> public to see. And we were like, "Okay, Dorky, you need to delete this right now." <laughs> I see. <laughs> it's an incredible story. Uh. Okay, a couple other questions we have on our little question sheet here is uh, the time trials. So obviously, you know, it was incredible that you guys came in with the eighth overall seed uh, and, you know, defeated Echo and Omega Pump to, or to win out of your group. Uh, but, you know, how, how did you end up getting that eighth seed? Was that something you were happy with? How did the time trial process go for you guys? Uh, I was the, I I guess I didn't know what to expect, but I thought we could have done a lot better. It was hard because, so the the way the time trial format worked was they give you two dungeons with two uh, set of affixes, and they said, look, you got all the time in the world. You get like a week, 
let's you know just post your fastest times and we're like you know coming up with the most wild out of control routes because we're like if we can just run the dungeon over and over and over for infinite times like we have to have the most wild route to qualify and we were we kept changing a lot of stuff and trying a lot of stuff and nothing ever really seemed to work and we got some okay times but stuff that wasn't really perfect and then as the week goes on we just see um the perplexed and echo and complexity and them posting some just like crazy fast times and we're like trying to theory craft like how are they going so fast like trying to calculate like what their boss damage are and their splits and stuff and it turns out like i don't think none of their routes were that crazy maybe they had some secret tech there was some uh some secret off-limits technology in dos that was available that time that we don't know if they used and in halls i think they just like i think we were maybe over complicating it a little bit because it was our first time so yeah i think that was the time trials is what spurred our very heavy practice schedule because i think all of us kind of realized like well we're okay we're not quite on their level like we really got to figure this out we're a little bit behind and i think it sort of motivated us all to really put in the hours oh, actually so dorky says actually we wanted to get eighth seed to get echo so we could eliminate them before finals never mind so sorry scratch my answer so this is a carefully Calculated. carefully targeted uh you know surgical strike aimed at the exact seed you wanted uh yes. falling in a narrow band here of this one minute range of your two times yeah yeah uh, i see a complicated strategy but uh i'm glad it worked. i'm glad it worked out for you guys so if, in terms of time management since it was your first time charles do you think if you did it differently or if you did it again would you do things differently with like how much time you put into certain polls or more into one dungeon over the other uh, I don't know. What does Yoda think? I'm kind of wondering yeah. what. So, yeah. okay. Honestly, I want to say that like doing not so hot in time trials is probably the best thing that happened to our team because like it really gave everyone the motivation to just step step up. Like our our DOS was compared to our DOS like that we put up in the time trial is like just so much better. Everything's so much cleaner. Everyone knows what they're doing, and we just gained time like magically out of nowhere. It felt like. Um, but anyway, I think one of the big things we should have focused on is we spent a lot of time in halls. I would say. I think we had seven days and basically we thought, oh, we have infinite time. Our first reaction to that was we have infinite time. People just, people used to do this with three days. We have seven. So we literally, I don't want to say threw the first day away, but we streamed the first day and I was just playing a different class in every done, in every I run. Remember, I remember when you got, when you tried affliction yeah. uh, and you were having people te just coach you about what buttons you're supposed to press. <laughs> yeah. So we thought we had a lot of time. And then also, uh, if you, Notice, like, the I would say the halls timers, like, I would say we had a pretty relatively bad halls run. We had a 14-minute, but even our 14-minute halls run is still, like, within a minute and a half of the fastest halls run, right? But then our DOS run is, like, it's it's the same level, but it's four minutes behind. So I would say uh, if I would have fixed anything, I would have spent more time in DOS because I think you would gain more seeding points, I guess, seeding ranks by having a faster DOS and a faster hulls. Uh, I think the I think the whole point about the uh, waste quote unquote of the first day is is really mind provoking or thought provoking because I always feel like people want to test out so many specs in MDI. Like once you get the dungeons and the affixes, you want to test like three or four different DPS specs out and see which one will perform better. But I always feel like that's a trap because you just need so much muscle memory and repetition right off the bat. I don't know. What do you think? Would you have rather just ran with one spec instead of trying them in hindsight? Well, at the same time, we didn't quite know which specs were the good ones yet. Uh, I think like the Frost Mage Subrogue thing didn't really surface until Perplex posted their times. Uh, but I do think once they posted that, we should have probably just changed switch gears and, and gone with it. It's yeah. hard because yeah. it's not just one person, right? Like, in theory, let's say you have a team of five people and all four people are doing everything exactly the same. And then that one other person is like, oh, let me try Fire Mage. Let me try Fire Mage with this Covenant. Let me try Warlock. Yeah, you might get some good, you know, but then the problem is we're all trying to learn together. So it's like the Mage wants to try something different. Dorky wants to try something different. Yoda wants to try something different. Like, I right. want to play Resto Druid. And it's really, really hard to actually get the the repetitions in at all and like to even know if any of the specs you know like did we even give so maybe those specs that we tried could have been good but we didn't give them a fair shot because we were also trying variables like 
X, Y, and Z, and we don't even know. Like, it, it, it seems like infinite time, but then, you know, you can you can burn through eight hours just trying random specs in not very efficient ways, like, real quick. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of a mythic Kel'Thuzad, where, you know, you just, you nearly kill the phylactery one time, and then in the next pull, you, like, kill the phylactery 20 seconds early, and then the next pull, it's like, oh, it doesn't die at all, and it's because you're, like, shifting way too much between each pull right and it's like instead yeah. of just changing one thing that will let you then get a pretty good idea of like if you know you fit you come up with something good to change you try it out instead it's a case of like oh five different people each change something and so the entire you know all the structure that you've made all your decisions based off of is just uh goes away but i mean it's really tough to to prevent that from happening while also experimenting enough to actually come up with good strats, right? Like coming up with something like prop paladin arms warrior in a, in a dungeon, uh, coming out with that kind of thing, you know, that, that requires some openness to experimentation. So uh, it is a, a thin line to walk between the two. Yeah. I think you just have to have some constants, like as someone who plays a lot of healers and someone who kind of understands all the different healers, there were a lot of opportunities where I genuinely felt like we could have made another healer work and it maybe was even the best thing, but it was just too hard when, okay, let's say we do a big pull and we do it with Ash and now I want to try Resto Shaman. And it's like, well, we need to find a total way to solve this pull now because we were using Ash to carry us through this. And it's like, yeah, you can innovate in some ways, but like, for example, with Paladin, we kind of just decided that, okay, I'm just going to play Paladin for every match. Like, even though we could have probably made Resto Druid work or Resto Shaman work in some of the keys, maybe it's like, we just, we can't be switching all that stuff all the time. And I just have to be like, especially as a healer, I just have to be doing the same thing every time and like, let my team sort of find their bounds and get good at what they're doing. I kind of like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like locking yeah. in one or two people and, uh, that gives the other people a little bit more space to to experiment. Yeah, the more constants you have, the more you can tell uh, which variables you're changing are actually working. I think that's a really good point. Okay, uh, next question is in regards to Mist of Tierna Scythe. So in Mist, we saw a lot of different variability between different teams running different ideas in this dungeon. You guys were on this uh, magic damage comp with that Kyrian Moonkin that we have yet to talk about. Uh, but I'm sure we will talk about some more. Um, we saw some other teams doing this kind of stuff with, you know, Shadow Priests. Uh, and the idea is you get the magic damage debuff from the, the Vengeance Demon Hunter, and then you got some casters. Whereas Echo, on the other hand, was on this melee strategy that was also pretty common in a lot of dungeons of we got a warrior, we got a windwalker, those are buffing our melee, and then we'll use a rogue and a hunter that also do heavy physical damage uh, to, you know, benefit from that. How do you end up making the decision between like which of those kind of paths you want to go down? Uh, and also, I guess I, I also want to hear hear about the uh, the Moonkin and the Kyrian specifically at some point. So uh, Yoda, why, why don't you answer whichever parts of those you'd like? All right. Uh, so for the Mists, I guess we tried the we tried the Warrior Comp a little bit, but then I think we we were struggling on the first boss push. Obviously, it's doable, but just watching Echo, they completely annihilated the first boss compared to us. I don't even think that, I don't even think they had Ashen, and they still annihilated it. So it's obviously doable. Um, we were struggling a little bit, and then when we got to the maze, one of the main problems was uh, for the Windwalker. Obviously, there's a pack in that's just like in the room that you get to. Then there's a whole nother pack that's coming that the hunter pulls with his pet. Uh, the main problem, one of the problems we were having was that the Windwalker basically couldn't push any buttons at all until the other pack was in. Otherwise, like, you know, the first pack would die, and then what are you doing with the second pack? And also, yeah. he, the Windwalker actually had to commit a lot of his skills, like his defensives, his sweep. Like, a lot of our stuff had to be used to stop Bucking Rampage just to keep the Windwalker in. Uh, and we decided it was somewhat, I think, I think we decided if it was executed properly, it'd be faster in the maze. But then once we got past the maze, uh, the end of the dungeon would be a lot harder with that comp because the the pulls are usually like a lot bigger. There's a lot more mobs in them. And so we were like, okay, so what do we play? What would we play uh, Frost Mage for starters, Demon Hunter, and then Paladin. Then the last two were kind of for grabs. We did, we were playing with a Windwalker, I think, for most of practice. Uh, and obviously, if we don't play Hunter, the only thing that can pull through walls after all the fixes was uh, Moonkin, I think. Or one of the one of the better ones to pull through walls was Moonkin. Uh, and we started with Venthyr Moonkin, but we realized that the key was just far too low for Venthyr Moonkin to work. Because basically, what what would happen is you would pop, I would pop my cooldowns, 
and then the pack would die before I even reached my max ramp. And then, you know, on the next pack, I'm just a moon, basically a, a no covenant moonkin that's completely useless. Uh, so, one one of the good things that happened to our team actually is we noticed that JB was playing Kyrian Resto Druid, and then we checked his legendary. We're like, what the heck? What is that legendary? What does that do? And so we tried it out, uh, and then actually the first person to try it out was Growl because he was he, we were try, we were gonna try Resto Druid, and then he linked our Frost Mage, and then suddenly Cryptics just like got his damage just like went through the roof. It was like triple. Okay, not actually triple, but oh, it, shit. Was, it was it was crazy. They were like. Okay, well, we know Kyrian, the Kyrian link works better if you're a DPS because it gives you, I believe, it adds damage to your, it just does damage instead of, as a healer, it heals. And obviously, you know, healers are worthless, so we don't yeah. care about them. We care more about the damage. Of course, um, of course. Yeah, so we're like, okay, let's just try, let's try Kyrian Moonkin and see how it goes. And then, it act, my damage numbers were quite low, but our speed was actually unchanged. So you're like, okay. Let's just go with it. This is magical. I don't quite understand it. Hopefully it works out. And then uh, we, just, we just ran with it, basically. Yeah, not just in Mist as well. You guys took it into a couple other dungeons, right? Yeah, well, well once we realized that it was actually playable, uh, Dorky, I think Dorky really likes playing with the Moonkin because he's played Moonkin before in Legion. And they do have a lot of cool utility. Like Ursa is really useful in a lot of dungeons. Trees, obviously, is good. Beam is crazy in MDI because you pull a gajillion casters and you need to stop them from killing you. Um... But yeah, I think once we realized that Kyrian Moonkin was like an acceptable class in our eyes, uh, we started trying it out in almost every dungeon. I think it's actually really funny that I don't know if people are familiar with the MDI meta, but everyone's playing on a realm essentially. There's one realm for NA and one realm for EU, and you can just see what everyone's doing all the time. Like you can just go into the realm, type slash who miss, and you can see like oh what's perplex running, and it's something that all all the top teams do. And it's got it's funny to me that almost the whole practice time because you saw all the dungeons we played Kiri and Moonkin no one even asked no one even tried it no one even did anything like everyone probably just assumed we were just out of our minds they're just like what is this team doing they're just running Kiri and Moonkin in in all these games like what are they doing well, I, I got some tells dorky <laughs> did you get some me? tells okay yeah. dorky pinged me like five days or something before like on monday right before the mdi and he's like you guys are gonna hate our comps or something maybe it was like tuesday <laughs> or some shit he's like you guys are gonna hate our comps and then we had a recording session uh for the gg wow stuff on like wednesday with the ambition guys and i was like oh yeah so dorky said something about their comp being weird as hell for a bunch of their dungeons do you know what they're doing and ones you in nerf are immediately like Bro, this guy, Yoda, is on a fucking Kyrian Moonkin. He has <laughs> lost his mind. He's lost his damn mind for playing Kyrian Moonkin. And I'm sitting there in that, in that call, and I'm like, why the hell is he playing it? And then it's like, once you start seeing it, you realize that it's just like a Shadow Priest. It's just a support. Like, that's all it really is. It's just, it's just another Shadow Priest support kind of thing. But whenever you hear it the first time, it's exactly like what they said. Has he lost his damn mind? Why is he playing that? Because you look at your overall damage, and you are doing rogue damage without the pro without the good priority parts of the rogue. Yeah, it's a little bit tragic for the overall, but we do we make sacrifices for the team when we have to. Did you guys end up reading the uh, the Peyton Tettleton Wowhead Bounds Druid Kyrian Guide at all? There's some good content in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that guide is the that guide is the well. I, I didn't actually read the Kyrian part, uh, but oh, it's, I, that guy's there's, there's some good stuff in here. Um, that is the, that is the first guide I read when I was trying to learn Minkin. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of a lot of just kind of explaining about how this stuff works. Then, if you could not follow that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the link is so complicated. Yeah. Uh, that link is actually so okay. stupid it, complicated. It's really complicated if you try to think about do if you try to do math, but. Just like once you simplify it to <laughs> I link friend, he does big damn, uh, it, it becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. That is definitely the answer. You link to a friend that does big damn, you guys share a pool of damage. But he you're only able to spend it at a rate of 15% bonus damage per damage instance. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I don't know about that and I don't want to know. Yeah. I, I link <laughs> friend. I, I link friend. He makes me fast. We do big damn. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. It, it's literally not relevant. It, it, that that legendary though that Yoda's running is very overtuned. That kindred affinity legendary is very strong. Yeah, so this is giving you eight percent haste, and it's giving cryptics eight percent haste, 
And then that doubles to 16% whenever you actually empower your bond, which is 10 seconds out of every minute, right? Um, yeah, well, there there is another build that we were originally experimenting with, with Mechanicos. And there's also a condo that reduces the cooldown. So you could actually have that bond up quite a bit longer, but we did, I decided it was impractical. Maybe someone else will find it useful. Yeah, well, that was the original Resto Druid idea was play the really short... Because I think you could get the link to under 40 seconds cooldown, and then you just put it on the Windwalker or like the Rogue or someone who does a lot of consistent damage, and you just blast it on cooldown every time, and it's like giving a ton of stats. But yeah, the Resto Druid just... The problem is it can't spend the damage, so you're juicing your friend, but then you're doing nothing with your stats, so it's kind of like half of a bond, which was still good enough to see play in the MDI, as you guys saw. But... yeah that's cool it's cool to hear how it was like uh you know how you guys took that idea that you saw and, and like innovated off of what jb was up to it definitely was very cool when jb first busted out that that legendary you, as well do you think that you're ever gonna end up playing like a resto druid like is there ever like a real need for it maybe like a five night elf comp i think would be the only real thing that like the most reasonable thing at least but like it's it's kind of hard to get healers off of holy paladin yeah, so I think a lot of people ask about healers. So the way I see it is, like, as a default, you play Holy Paladin. Druid and Priest are your Night Elf options if you need to do some sort of Shadow Meld thing. Priest, I think, is generally a better pick just because in the really big pulls, you gain more from PI. But with the Kyrian Druid, I think it's comparable. So let's say you wanted some of the things that Druid brings, like that Vortex or like that, uh, like a Battle Res or a Soothe. Like, for example, the where JB was using it in that DOS, I was actually wanting to play Resto Druid in that key because it was raging explosive uh dos right so not only do you get that soothe for the raging but you also have a spammable range thing that you can use to kill the explosive and i felt like playing paladin in that key was really bad because i'm just spending all of my damage globals killing explosives as a paladin i'm like why am i even a paladin like just let me be a druid so i can at least run around and kill these and my team said no but that was why that was why jb was doing it so i think in very specific affixes you can make it work or if you're someone like jb who's just very good at druid and it's like you know not just a comfort pick but it's like something he's good at i think you can make it work but i don't know maybe i think paladin is just like not just ashen but bubble and sack and devo are just all like such good buttons for mdi setting it's true and honestly the single target you bring during ashen and lust is just so ridiculous compared to any other healer like yeah like you're saying even though that was such a good situation for rest of druid h pal was probably still the better pick if you didn't have to kill orbs during those single target burns right yeah exactly and i mean during those burns the way that we usually set it up is just have someone else kill the explosives like before like let's say there was a big lust uh, you know pull or whatever just have someone use their cooldowns beforehand to kill the pull before and then that person's the one's killing the explosives while i'm the one blasting and then usually they just let the explosives go off and then they say well ashen's up it's fine <laughs> yeah, I can't argue with that. What's the problem? I don't see a problem. Yeah, it was like a, it was a very specific pull in Spires where I was needing to ash in and I asked Yoda to kill the explosives. And then, like, at the first time he did it, I'm like, man, this is awesome. Finally, I can actually like do good stuff in my ash. In. And then, as we practiced the pull, it got slowly and slowly harder. And then, eventually, Yoda was just like, I found a hack for this pull. I'm like, oh god, finally. And he's like, so I can just let the explosives go off because you have ash and I don't need to kill them. And I'm like, oh, that's the hack. That's okay, the hack. Great. <laughs> Yeah, problem solved. I love that. All right, um, let's see. We have some more stuff to talk about, like looking forward now at Globals and MDI in the future rather than looking back at the last weekend. But first, we have to do our tip of the week segment, which uh, I don't know if you guys pre prepped any. Of course, not required. Uh, but we can start with mine, which is if you ever need to know what a weak aura, what weak aura or which add-on is creating an icon on your screen, right? Like say you've got just some annoying icon on the middle of your screen, you have no earthly idea which weak aura is putting it there and you need to get rid of it. Type slash frame stack. That's just one word, slash frame stack. It will make your screen all green and stuff. And whenever you mouse over something, it will tell you exactly what add-on path it's following to, to put that entity there. And also a useful help, a useful tool for uh, analyzing which weak auras are causing memory leaks and whatnot. If you right click the weak aura icon that's on your mini map, you get like this debugger window and you can run it, run it on the next instance of like combat and you can see if any weak auras are taking up unnecessary memory. Oh yeah, I remember when the stun DR tracker just started uh, like exploding uh, 
you know, there was some some memory leak in there or something in like Nylotha. The the green one where yeah. it was like green, yellow, red when yeah. it was on Stun VR. Yeah, because everybody was playing with a bunch of outlaw rogues. Of I missed that week or I missed that one too, yeah. Yeah, that was a good I miss one. Outlaw Rogue. Same. That's so sad. Uncap Outlaw Rogue. So true. <laughs> Somebody called JPC, he's crying. <laughs> Alright, Charles, what is your tip of the week? Speaking of rogue, uh, mine's about numbing poison. Numbing poison is insane for anyone that ever plays with the rogue in Mythic Plus. It's basically if they have it on, it's like a fifteen percent DR for your tank at all times. Uh, the melee speed alone, the the fifteen percent re reduced melee speed of mobs is so good for every tank spec. Plus, it allows the groups that are maybe newer groups to have a little bit more time to kick each cast as well. So, highly recommend. In fact, you should you should you should probably default to using numbing poison, except for huge pulls where your tank needs to kite, and you don't have any other options to slow them, and that's when you would take crippling. But otherwise, always numbing poison. Damn. Yeah, that's this goes in that spot, right? It's either crippling or numbing in your non-lethal poison slot. Definitely a, a good yeah. one to consider. Okay, uh, let's see. Tettles has for us now a clip of the week. So let me see if I can pull it up this is a great clip yeah oh, this, this is a very this, very good clip this is a banger for sure oh boy i'm not oh, sure you guys no. i'm not sure if uh, your audience will have audio for this one uh growl but uh they've, they've all they've, seen i'm the sure clip. they've seen this one several times <laughs> yeah so we'll play this thing dude if tanks didn't have cheat this game holy fuck you just hammered yeah, too fuck. oh my uh, god I, I mean i had saw it <laughs> <laughs> no, man! Dude. What the hell? <laughs> so, so for those who, uh, like, listeners and stuff, the I hit Sagadon, and then just the hook flies out from the, the Necrotic Wake out and drags Sagadon into the boss fight. Whew. Luckily, this clip was salvaged could... from uh, Dorky Bear Z before we had to purge the account. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know you could grab Sagadon with the hook. I'll be honest, I didn't know either. I just said it because I saw it happening. And I think after you hear me say that, no one else says anything. We're all just like stopping watching, wondering if it happened. And then he just grips it and we're just like, oh no. Oh no. I like how that just works by default in the code. Like there's nothing, nothing it didn't bug it out. It just hooked Sagan on right into yeah. the boss fight. All right. Uh... Let's see, if either Growl or Yoda, if either of you have uh, have tips that, that jump to mind, now is the time. Otherwise... I didn't I didn't prepare any, but uh, here's a good tip. Okay. Storming is a very easy affix to simply ignore, but it's important to pay attention to it uh, when there's things that you have to dodge or place coming up, as we just saw. Make sure you don't uh, get stormed and pull socket on. <laughs> or you get stormed into a Dark Lotus. That's true, yeah. So, actually, I think... I think soaking stormings as a tank as well, if, if there's nothing dangerous going on, a uh, reasonable thing to do now, because uh, it just goes away at that point, particularly if you've got like casters close to your group uh, and you don't want them to have to move. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I it, it can be. I think do, it's actually, uh, before you go into that, I think it's actually kind of dangerous to soak storming as a tank in high keys at least, just because sometimes the mobs will walk underneath you and hit you from behind. Oh. Or... Yes. It'll like it'll knock you a little bit away from the pack, and some mobs will move a little bit far from the the mobs that stand still in the pack. So then Makes you'll sense. lose a little bit of damage from the group. But anyway, go on, tell us. Com completely unrelated to storming. Does anybody know anything about that theater of pain champion like mini boss bug? Because I I've heard rumors that that's happening a lot on live this week. Now. It just happened. I think it has to do with because there was actually a reset in uh, in lot in the TR right or one of the matches where there was a reset that had to do with the mini boss. And if I had to guess, they probably tinkered with it in a way that they shouldn't, and then now they broke it on live is what I think happened. So it's something that just popped up, but I've been hearing it happen a lot, where like the mini boss either spawns really, really late or doesn't spawn at all. I've yeah, heard, that's I've happened to me in every theater I've done this week, uh, which is two or three, That's uh, which is you know a lot of theaters it's happened in. Um, so definitely be ready for that. The, it doesn't stop you from progressing through the dungeon, though. You just have to go get your count elsewhere. Um, but you can keep walking forward through the dungeon. So uh, I would say go Zavwing not last so that you know how much count you need. Uh, and then just pick up some extra, like pull extra side platforms and cult the rocks wing. If you miss that count, that's a good tip. I have a tip. It's like kind of small, but it's something that I came to terms with in practice was 
So as a healer, this is like healer specific, but as a healer from the Veruth power, you have the option to either take these orbs that give you mana over the course of the dungeon, or you basically get like 200 crit or like 210 crit or whatever. And for the longest time, I was trying to make it work with the crit one because it's like, well, the mana orb does nothing. Just manage your mana forehead, right? Like, why wouldn't you just take the crit? But watching some of the best healers in the world in MDI still take the mana power just because like... If even if it only saves you five seconds in the dungeon from having to drink one time, like it's gonna be worth it. So I think if there are any healers out there that are trying to just like, oh, I don't want to take the mana power, I need to learn to manage without it, like just click the freaking mana orbs. Like it just makes everything easy and you don't have to think. Especially on like tyrannical, if there's like hard bosses, don't feel bad about taking the mana powers. Like I just started doing it in every dungeon on every healer, because why not? Like 200 crit is like nothing anyway. Especially on the healer. Yep, true. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's move on to talking about the looking forward to the future of your team at MDI and stuff. Uh, where, of course, the nearest thing in the future, I guess, is first is going to be the last day in tournament to determine the eighth team to enter the uh, to enter the global finals. Uh, which I, I don't know, were, were you guys going to plan, had you guys talked at all about if you were going to play this, if you didn't qualify, uh, or was that not something that, you know, crossed your minds at all before this last weekend? I think we were playing. We were definitely playing. I mean, maybe, I guess it depends on, you know, maybe something tragic would happen, but as far as I know, we had, we had full intentions of trying our hardest and qualifying and we thought we had a good chance of qualifying, but also if we didn't, I think unless things would have went catastrophic, I think we would have played the last stand too. But holy moly, is there so many good teams in it. Yeah, we really didn't want to go to the last stand, but obviously we yep. tried. Yeah, so last stand is going to... Right now, this weekend, the time trials are on for that. Uh, and then six teams will come out of those time trials. Next weekend, they're going to play. And it's basically a great push style event where these six teams will be simultaneously doing keys uh, at the key levels and affixes set by Blizzard. Uh, and they'll be speedrunning them as fast as they can collecting score based on total time taken at 15 hours of play time. So similar to the great push, but across three days uh, as before. Uh, and yeah, the top team will qualify out of that to join the other seven teams at global finals. Um, I personally am very excited for this format for the last day in tournament. I'm extremely hyped for, for this thing. I think it should be great fun to watch. Uh, I don't know. You, now you guys have played both the great push and you know, a traditional MDI weekend. Uh, how did you feel about the difference between those two formats and, you know, the last stand kind of halfway in between the two of them? Uh, how does that look to you guys as, as potential competitors in this sort of thing in the future sometime? Uh, I, I still say. like Great Push, I think. I think I still prefer Great Push. MDI is something that I hate. Like, hated isn't yeah. the right word, but until you play the matches it sucks but once you play the matches like something jb tweeted was he he had a problem with people saying that skills don't transfer between live keys and mdi and he says they're the same thing and i felt that wasn't true and i felt they were very different all the way until we got to our match and then as soon as we got to your match then it's a live key right then it's here's your one key if you deplete it your chance is gone you have to you know what i mean like there's no other options other than this one run so i think i still prefer great push i also think it leads itself to have less problems like for example the reload uh remake or whatever like that's just not a thing in this new form in the the last stand right like teams are just gonna play and i don't see a world where like anything would happen because of that i think because of the nature of wow i think it's good to have a format like that at least some of the time because it eliminates a lot of problems i yeah. was gonna say one of the main problems with the great push format i think is that it it incurs you to do low percentage pulls Whereas in like an MDI, you obviously, if you have a route that's like sub fifty percent success rate, then you're gonna have a bad time in the MDI. But in the great push, especially when the key doesn't deplete, uh, you're encouraged to do like these crazy strats that may have a low success rate, but if you get it once, you know that's your time. So uh, if they could fix that, I guess maybe if the key depleted or something, uh, I'd, I feel they're gonna hate me, but I think that would be a better format. Uh, but overall, I think. Overall, I like that. I like the Great Push format, except for that one thing. Yeah, and, and this upcoming event doesn't even have the, you know, pushing the key level part of it, right? It's key levels and affixes 
set by Blizzard. So we may even see way more of that than we did in the Great Push because they, you know, you don't have to just put up a time and go to the next dungeon and like start, you know, build up the keys, right? You just have 15 hours to blast however many keys they give you uh, at the, you know, the level they say. So yeah, we may, we may well end up, I think that's, this is a good, you know. Well, one thing I want to say though, in, in response to Yoda is it's very different from the qualifiers In the qualifiers. It was six days or seven days or whatever, where you just go over and over again. But in the last stand or in great push, you have 15 hours. Like if you're doing, yeah, maybe the very first pull of the dungeon can be kind of risky, but if you're going to go and go for a 30 minute run where it has a very low success rate, where, you know, the last pull or even halfway through the dungeon, like I remember from when we were playing with great push, like sometimes it felt like, like, I remember our theater, when we slammed out a really good theater 26, it felt so good because it was like, okay, we just, we only spent 30 minutes on this and we're done. And I think the time is the resource that you're spending. I don't think it's a, it's a no risk pull when you do that. I mean, I do agree that um, it's kind of feels lame on the first pull because you really are incentivized to do some in maniacal first pull just because you can just go again right away. But I think in a format with only 15 hours or less, I think it's it actually hurts you pretty bad time wise to just, you know, play really risky. Yeah. To, to put it in perspective, right in the great push, it was six dungeons, right? And so 15 hours divided among six dungeons was two and a half hours per dungeon. Um, now, obviously we don't know how many are going to be in last stand. Theoretically, I guess it could be eight. Uh, or could be less, but still, that divides each dungeon to only have a couple of hours, you know, total put into it, right? So you can't you can't just spend that long resetting it over and over again. Uh, you do have to actually put a time up and then get on to the next dungeon. Uh, well, I guess you're right. I was thinking it would only be two dungeons, and I also was thinking they'd have prep time, but none of neither of those are true. They're just going in. Yeah, we. I, I, I don't think we know just two either. Right. Um, a lot of a lot of details about exact. Look, exactly what they do definitely are, are important there. You know, obviously, if they chose, if they gave you just one dungeon in 15 hours, that would be very different. Um, but I don't think they'll do that. But I guess we don't know for sure. It says key levels, so it must be at least two. But I would bet on more. I'd bet, I would bet it would look more like the Great Push, uh, number wise. Do, do you think that the simultaneous, like, speedrunning thing, like, where all of the teams are competing at once, is like a better format for the MDI moving forward? Yeah, I also think it's better for viewers too. And now, granted, the head to head format definitely has some benefits. Like, it's, for instance, in our matches, there were a lot, just a, a lot of crazy, exciting things and back and forth that happened that you can't necessarily have those moments when you have a, you know, like the last stand format. But ultimately, sometimes the matches really, really drag on, like when it's a 20 minute dungeon and you pretty much know who's going to win. And I think in the, in like the, 15 hour format i think it lends more to like okay you can tune in you can see a team do a crazy pull and then you can kind of back out and you can have one person kind of directing the action and oh this team's about to do a crazy pull and i think it's a lot more likely that someone who's watching stays interested and stays engaged because the action is constantly changing and there's things that are happening maybe i'm biased in that because i just i just kind of like that style anyway but i feel like it would be better for the viewer and i think most of the mdi people that were watching probably like they tune in because they want to watch that one match and they don't really are you know they're not really sticking around for the whole thing so an interesting sure. format is one that i saw uh or we, i think we participated in it was the keystone masters format where yeah. you have all the teams play and then the slowest one is eliminated they're all playing simultaneously the slowest ones eliminated so let's say you have eight teams right round one there's eight teams whoever's slowest is gone next round there's seven next round there's six and then you build up all the way to the grand finals I think that that would be a that'd be a pretty good format. Yeah, I, I I did casting for that one, and that was um, that was sweet. They did like a when it got down to four teams, they had each team pick one of the affixes that went on the next keystone. When it got down to three, they like had a poll or something. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that part. Yeah, obviously but... the poll is you know, <laughs> yeah, the polls are always scary. The polls always get a get some hate, but yeah, I don't know. I I I thought that the that format was pretty cool because uh, like having the teams play simultaneously, but not you know, indefinitely, right? Simultaneously, but just one attempt uh, kind of gets the best of both worlds, right? Where you, there's no chance of them just resetting over and over again. On the other hand, you know, if you encountered a run-ending bug in that kind of circumstance, you'd have to actually fix it again, right? And just have them restart, I guess, and put their best time up, something like it, that. It would also it would also be hard, I guess, you'd have to do like three maps because like there, there are some maps that are obviously like favored more and less for other teams, right? Yeah. Like, 
You guys I mean, said that. You guys said that you guys put in an insane amount of practice in the Necrotic Wake. There may have been other teams that didn't put as much practice in the Necrotic Wake. That kind of thing. I well, don't you tell your practice for the format, right? Yeah. So you, yeah, you probably wouldn't get, pra you would probably wouldn't practice round one very hard because you know you're not going to get it. Hopefully, you don't get a, if you're a top team. Hopefully, you don't get eliminated in, in the first round. Sure. But you might practice the grand finals more, or even the second or third finals. Yeah, whatever. that's a good point. That's yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, you know, if you have a bad map and it shows up in tournament and you lose because of it. I think that's fair. It's yeah, definitely, definitely like fair. it's in some ways it can feel kind of arbitrary because like if it had been a different map you would have been fine, but I don't know. That's uh, when you start getting it to the point where like okay we will test you on like every single dungeon then then all of the chance of of there being any kind of exciting result kind of goes away too. Okay, um, cool. Let's talk a little bit about your prep and expectations then for global finals, which. I'm not sure if we know when that's going to be yet, but we do know seven of the eight teams that will be playing in it. And of course, the eighth team will be coming out of the last to stand tournament. Here is the, uh, so here are the groups and it's just the top row and the third row from the group. So Perplexed, Hill Factory, which is now Complexity, Echo, Team Name, Obey Alliance, Incarnation, uh, and then Aster, Aster is coming from China. And they had some really cool strats in some of their runs against Skyline that secured them the dub skyline who by the way are might be competing in that last stand tournament and certainly would be a uh, a force there as well along with potentially she's ambition omega pump you know all of these teams actually the fourth seeds from all these groups as well it's going to be a stacked tournament so that'll be exciting uh but, skyline allowed yeah it's, in less than the chinese That's crazy chinese oh my goodness. can play in it too yeah um so it should be cool to watch but you guys now already knowing like you know, six of the other eight teams, and most importantly, knowing that you are playing in the global finals, you know, what does the next couple weeks and stuff look like for you guys uh, prepping for that? I think we're mostly on break for now. You know, this, right now we're hard yeah, chilling. We're, We've been yeah. like, like, like Tettles, when he said we were playing 16 hours, he was exaggerating, but not by very much. <laughs> like we were playing a lot of hours, a lot of days, and I think everyone's just kind of vibing right now. I hope that it doesn't turn into sort of the reverse of what happened before, where before we did poorly and then we were like, you know, in all the time we had, we were practicing. Now we did well and they're like, all right, let's play Diablo. Let's do whatever. Like, we don't need to log in. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I hope that my team is ready to start battling and start practicing soon. But it is pretty grueling and it is pretty tough to just do it day in, day out. So I hope that I'm sure once we get our affixes, it's going to be basically morning till night every day like in in the that's the most important time and then maybe in between we might spend some days to like practice and shore up some comps or route ideas or things that maybe echo did or other teams did that we thought we wanted to copy that we didn't quite have time to practice but yeah, yeah we, def we definitely we now. definitely have some echo tech to work out yeah echo tech yeah oh by the way are there any specs that you didn't see coming like uh may have tested out some stuff but then when you watch the cups back you're like oh wow that's expected really great any surprises uh, warlock from omega pump inspires actually we yeah, we thought we warlock thought, was going to be beans we thought we thought we had the hot shit with kirian vunkin but i think warlock might have actually been better because looking at their time they did the same first protoss pros us and they were actually they were actually ahead when the first boss died and that's supposed to be like moonkin's prime time you know like i just yeah, popped true. my cooldowns on the giant pole with the boss the fire and trash moon that's like moonkin's specialty boss and then you know we're behind after that boss so I think War Warlock might have been really strong in that dungeon. Cool. I feel like teams didn't really... Oh, well, when JB pulled out the Kyrian Wrestle Druid, I'm not going to lie, I'm embarrassed to say that during the time trials, I didn't inspect JB a single time, and his name was just JB Night Fae, and I just assumed that he was a Night Fae Druid, and what, like, oh my who God, the hell cares what he's going to play? <laughs> I actually did not know he... He played Kyrian Druid for... Almost at least half, if not all, of the the time trial or qualifiers, and I didn't even know what he was playing. So him taking out that Kyrian Druid, the Kyrian Russell Druid, definitely caught me off guard. Otherwise, I feel like teams weren't that creative. Like I don't, I didn't think that we were that creative personally. Like we pulled out a couple picks that we thought we good, but were good, but we weren't really going that crazy, right? Like we had a couple. Like our theater was a little different. The Kyrian Moonkin was kind of like our our thing. Maybe we had some other stuff too that we didn't get to show, but I don't think we played that crazy. And we were like the craziest. You know, I feel like people were kind of tame. Most of the people were like, "Oh, what does Perplex play? What does Echo play? Like, let's just play that." And 
I'll be honest, I'm a little bit guilty of that too. I'm like, oh, I want to be Echo. Let's just run what they do. So I don't know. I wasn't really. I feel like people weren't that crazy. I think there's a lot of classes that are good at a lot of things right now. And I think you could have made a lot of different comps work. Yeah, we actually saw a crazy amount of diversity over the course of the three MDI, you know, cup or group group weekends this time around. Uh, but there was definitely a heavy concentration, right? We saw all the healer specs except for uh, except for Holy Priest, but like 99%, 95% of the time it was Holy Paladins that were in, right? Uh, and similarly, like, you know, we saw we saw a couple of these specs once or twice each, but there was definitely a lot of uh, grouping towards a couple of of comps and and picks. Um, I think that the most the most surprising thing for me is that Guardian Druid was seen so infrequently. Like, yeah, I mean, I would have expected to see it at least on Necrotic or like uh, other things, but it felt like it was just that Dwarf Prop Warrior every single time. You seen a Krotik, it was just like dwarf carrying prop warrior. Dwarf yeah. carrying, or it's really it's just carrying that that solves necrotic for tanks. If it wasn't for carrying, I'm sure we would have seen a lot of guardians. Yeah, well, so one thing about MDI that maybe other people knew, but it took me a little while to learn is you think it's like oh you do really big pulls and you want a bunch of classes that are good for really big pulls, but it's actually the opposite that you want as little as possible for these big pulls because you pull them all together and you blow it up. And a lot of your time is actually spent killing the mini boss, killing a boss, you know, like theater has five different bosses and it's like, yeah, we true. like we kind of underestimated have like just having a sub rogue and just doing a bunch of boss damage. Like that's where I think we kind of lost track to kind of, go back to the the halls qualifier was we were like running all these crazy aoe classes that blow up trash and what did echo run and what did they run well they just ran sub rogue and frost mage and shadow priest and just did a bunch of just pulled small and did a bunch of single target damage and that's actually faster so i think that that's like sort of in line with why bear didn't get shown either is bear is great at doing ginormous pulls but it's, it's you know then what you have to kill a boss with your tank doing bear damage and it's like well this isn't that great yeah. I'd... Yeah. Plus, the MDI, the way it always goes for DPS, and this carries over to tanks and healers too, is DPS that have short CDs, like one minute or 45 second CDs, are almost always in a better position for MDI style runs because the big pulls happen so often. Like, you can't just bring a three minute boomkin class like they were talking about for Spires. You know, they, they did the first pull and then they didn't even get to ramp hardly for the next pull. Uh, or, same thing for Guardian. You, you'd use your incarn on the first giant pull and then you have like half your incarn left and you have nothing for the next four poles <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> that's probably fair all right well uh this has been very exciting thanks to for talking to us all about the mdi stuff we have a couple other little things to go on uh, to talk about before we're done with the show but uh, so here's just again a look at the upcoming mdi stuff last day in tournament coming next weekend uh and that is going to be very fun to watch. Looking forward to that a lot. So everybody should tune into that. Uh, and then we'll have winning the last finals. Stand? Can we get some predictions real quick? Who's winning last stand? I want to hear what you guys think. Ooh. I think for me, the favorite's probably Ambition. I think that they looked the best out of all of the, out of all the teams that got sent to the last, oh, at least they looked the most consistent out of all the teams that got sent to the last stand tournament. Cause like Shishino Mega Pump felt kind of the same to me where they were like, they're, maybe their theoretical runs are going to be like going to be faster, and maybe they're going to be favored a little bit better for this last stand format. Um, but I felt like their consistency was just like not as high as I would have liked to see. All right, I'm going to do a dark horse pick here. I, I don't know if they're actually going to play in this, but evolving uh, from from weekend A, uh, I was really impressed by some of their strats, and they were the fourth seed out of that group. They ended up doing reasonably well that. That time around, uh, but to to not just say ambition again, I think that if they play as a team, I'm excited to see what what kind of stuff they have for this tournament because I actually think they had a reasonable shot of qualifying out of that first group uh, with a way lower seeding than the teams above them. That's like Shelly on the Warlock on that team. Yeah, oh, Shelly's yeah. team. Okay, yeah, yeah Shelly Shelly's team. Uh, but I I don't actually don't know which of the teams that didn't qualify are actually going to play the last stand, uh, and I I don't know for sure that they even are. But if yeah, somebody are. in my chat says Sheesh isn't participating. I, I don't. I don't know anything about that. Like, if if they're not participating, then it, it's just weird because the format favors. Honestly, it favors teams like Sheesh, Omega Pump, and Reload Esports that have these fucking just wild runs, and their consistency was a lot lower 
um, than you needed to see. So, I mean, maybe they're going to be able to pull something out. I mean, Andy Brewer's group just, like, blows up and then reforms, like, every once in a while. So maybe they'll be reformed in time for that. Happens. It's actually impressive. They come back every time. They're, they'll, like, do really well and then, bam, implode. And then yeah, I mean, they're, they're, all insane. they're all insane players. And I think, like, they're just so charged that shit happens and then they get bad. Like, bad stuff happens and then they're like, oh, well. You know, they need a break, and then they're like, well, we all own. Let's just start playing together again, and maybe minus one or minus two people. But I think I think Ambition, I think also um, Reload is insane. I think Reload is going to surprise a lot of people in the tournament. Like, the routes that they were going for, just thinking, like, man, if they, let's say they're still practicing right now and they get another week of practice, like, they were they were really going for it. Like, they're, they, had, they had a crazy Sanguine. Their Necrotic Wake was not consistent, but it could have been crazy. I actually think I think Ambition is a favorite, but I think Reload is a close second. Dude, Reload's route for Necrotic Wake was Ambition's route from Necrotic Wake the week yep. before. They ran like mm. almost the exact same route. And whenever I saw it, I was like, holy shit. And then, and then they had some issues with the boss because it was a 22 Tyrannical. Dude, but it's like, so it, hard. Dude, I can't express how hard yeah. 22 Sanguine Tyrannical Necrotic Wake was. Oh my gosh. There's just so many, like every single pull is so hard and there's so many bad things that can happen with that dungeon. I agree. Yeah, it, I agree. Man, when we saw that first game between Echo and Reload Esports in Sanguine Depths, and, like, Reload Esports were winning with a, against a clean run from Echo for, like, 95% of that run, I yep. was just like, what is happening? So definitely a, a team to look out for. Yeah, should be a great tournament. I am, I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's do a couple other little topics here before we close out the show. One is Legion Time Walking coming back. Um, so... Growl, Yoda, you guys mostly started playing WoW in, like, BFA, right? Do you guys have any desire to do, like, Legion time walking stuff when it comes back? Is that something you have any interest in? Uh, about as much interest as Wrath time walking. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is no, it's a, it ain't it. It ain't it. I think, like, so I think... I think there's a way to implement it, but I think that I would like. But the way it's coming back, I, I feel like we're just going to do maybe Legion dungeons for a, a week at most. And then it'll just be back to business as usual. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. I yeah. think there's so much potential in old dungeons being rehashed and introduced into the map pool. Like, I always think of it like if it was like an RTS game where there's just like a map pool, you know, a dungeon pool. And then as as new dungeons come out, they get added to the pool and we keep the ones that we like and we remove the ones that we don't. Like, there's so much potential for those dungeons to be part of the Mythic Plus that we're playing today that I was excited at first when I heard about it. And I hope that it becomes like a gateway to get some of those dungeons fixed and back in. But as it stands now, I'm not very excited. Like, I haven't... Everything I hear about Legion Dungeons, they just seem like they suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, would be, it would be really cool if they did something like they implemented one of the dungeons or two or on a rotation or something into the current Mythic Plus meta. That would be so crazy. Yeah. And yeah. a really right. good way to reuse, yeah. use, to reuse content that's already out and would be low effort. A trade offer. Uh, after push week, how about we uh, go, do, go and do some Legion Dungeons and... Uh... So you guys can experience them a little bit. Deal? I I don't want to do them on PTR because I do want to experience them. Like okay, I want them to, I want it to come out on live and I want to play them. I kind of feel like everyone's just burning themselves out because oh yeah. When when no one's playing for anything, there's not that much fun. If there was like maybe some sort of event or I don't know, whatever. So either way, I'm I'm waiting till they come out to experience them. Just because I think as it stands, their like lifespan is kind of limited. So I just like I'm gonna have fun and I'm gonna play them for sure, especially if other people want to play them. But like I don't want to go on PTR and play Legion. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'll wait for that. I, I agree. I'm pretty firmly like anti spending too much time on PTR, like burning oneself out in in PTRs and in betas. Um, I agree though. Yeah, I mean I, the the week before they announced it, I had a video. I made a video about like wanting legion and, and not just legion but like freehold and iron docks and stuff to just like come in for a season into the map pool um and yeah then then they came out with this and they were like oh you got what you wanted but not this is not really it right this is uh, oh it's not no, it's clearly not that that's yeah. what i think a lot of people need to understand is that it wasn't like it's cool that they did that but that's not what i'm asking for like i'm not asking for oh i miss legion oh i miss bfa like i want diversity in the map pool for mythic plus so that we're doing more you know more we're not eight. spending half of the day in sanguine depth and i love yeah. that dungeon but i don't want to spend half the day in it because there's only eight dungeons def firm firm retweet from me all right uh let's see we got a, a little bit of q a to get to but first 
We get to thank the supporters on the Patreon who make our show possible every week. Uh, big thanks to all of you. They are Politoed is Allergice H2O, Kumkubine of Eustachondrias. If the devs are handing out comeback candy, can we get Great Vault Can't Give Me Loot I'm Already Wearing, unless it's a second one-handed weapon, next. Hello, insert name of Moonkin streamer. I saw a Kyrian Moonkin in MDI. When are you swapping to Kyrian? <laughs> Josh. Thanks, Yoda. <laughs> yeah. No problem, man. All right, moving on. Chromed, Trekky, Never Nude. Is that all right, moving on, just because I say that before we go into each new section? That's so mean. Uh, Never Nude, Chewy. <laughs> World First plus 28 is a prop pally. Dude, the tank meta at the top of the live keys is just six different colors. It's beautiful. Um, Incarnation, you made this old paladin very proud. Keep on crushing it. Now take these blood decay stonks to the moon. Uh, hopefully we'll be back on air in about two weeks. Thanks and stay safe, everyone. It's not AMZ, it's AMZ. Salty Senny, Nacris, Tank Dill, Nevuk, Bradceratops, Sinmora, Eevee keeps dying to slappy hands in Mythic Plus. Take Glide to the Protector and Frenzied Regen off the GCD. No trick, I scheduled a Tettles Flame. Die Mat. Instead of walking to raid, I glide, die, and release to raid. I've been doing that every time as well. The, it's so much better uh, than before. Oh my god, Tettles just changed it. Tettles just cha he literally just changed my my list and I've lost my place. Did you add something above where I am or just or no. no? Okay. I was deleting something that wasn't supposed to be there. Alright, Nyx. Uh <laughs> predictions for 9.1.5 releasing before, after, or at the same time as Renown 80. I think it has to be at the same time or after. Because not okay, so for those who don't know, like the covenant swapping, that's coming with Renown 80. There's no way they will put the patch out before we have Renown 80. So I'm calling it right now. That patch is is not like next week or the week after. That is is coming at the earliest the week we hit Renown 80. I was <laughs> I'll finish the Patreon reading. Gallic Brusif Dranos Rouncer Biffs. He didn't mute the thing. Oh Yorokove Shonen Insanity, Xena, We Are Praying, Hanny will pump in 9.1, Rogue is snap good enough for Frog, but still bad enough to be set for SLG Bless Up. Okay, muted, thank God. Um, red color, youtube.com slash workbringer. Walking Atlas has 2222 dungeon score, but it's still 9 out of 10 heroic. A horror of US Proudmore. KOZ's Mythic Plus team is trash cans and not trash cants. Alphabet Soup, Druid Friends of Evolved Gaming, number one Simpski for Trelski, Lilari. When you think it Lurk is going to butt pull, but then Loric Moon fires the first lieutenant on an accident, mid pull and mists before Ingram Malloc, then melds and murders Lurka. Oh, God, what a bad day. Uh, that one dude, RP walking in a Wrath and Basin comp stomp. Milk, 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 milk. Narnar, the Marsh Hare. Soji is the number one little green man on US Thrall. Thank you guys all so much. Um, Dratnos is gone, but now <laughs> it's time for Q&A, and I am taking over. First question we have, can y'all talk about how many deaths each of the Incarnation team members had coming from Dorky in Twitch chat? Growl? Wait, coming from Dorky in Twitch? Hold on. Um, yes. <laughs> let's see. I had, I, I had a, a majority of them, I think. I had three. I had one in a miss. I'm trying to remember back now. I feel like it was pretty even spread. Yeah, one in the Halls of Atonement. They got melee to death. Uh, I had two in the Halls of Atonement. I had one. Yeah, I had two in the Halls oh, of yeah. Atonement. I died with Ashen, and then at the end... So at the end, I thought Dorky was really dry, and I go to taunt the boss, because I we knew at that point that as long as we don't wipe. So I go to taunt the boss to get the debuff off Dorky, and the boss just bonks me in the head. And I'm just like, I just taunted to try and get the debuff. And Dorky was just like, that was a bad taunt. And I'm just like, what, <laughs> like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm fine, you just wasted five seconds, our time already sucks. And I'm just like, yeah, great thing. <laughs> yeah, I think it was... I think it was three deaths, two in the halls, one in the mist, and then uh, Yoda died in that halls. I remember resin Yoda. Was that it? I think that might have been it. Oh, um, Cryptics died in the Sanguine, I think. And, and Junkrat died in the Sanguine. Oh, and Cryptics died in the theater. Yeah. yeah so everybody. The theater. Okay, so everyone died but Dorky. That's what he wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, okay. I see where he was going <laughs> with this now. All right, I'm back. All right. Hello. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> is there a fire going on? What's no, happening? No, dude, the, the, the fire alarm just like went off for 10 seconds and then it's back. I couldn't see any fire. Can't smell any fire. 
I'm was sure that like the fine. fire alarm for the whole state of California? Yeah, maybe. It's always on fire. <laughs> Ah, that's true. Okay. Um, <laughs> here's our next right, we question. Have the, we have the Twitter questions. Yeah. yeah. This one's from at Rachu who asks, who came up with the SD giga chain pull and how inebriated were they at the time? Yeah, that was definitely a dorky idea. We were doing Veruth and we couldn't, Echo actually had a really good idea with extending it in the middle of the second boss, but we were trying to figure out how to link all the urns together. And Dorky's just like, what if I drag these mobs over to here? And I'm just like, you know, like, uh, you know whatever, like, just do it. And I mean, it works out sometimes. Yeah, that was, that was a, it was a Dorky recreation. Another amusing fact is that after the MDI, I checked our Discord and I just see a, a link of Sanguine MDT. And it was just that room, except pulled even bigger. And I didn't know if it was like in satire or why, but there was just another sanguine route that was even more aggressively. Pulled oh, we're going bigger in, in, in yeah. game final. <laughs> yeah, see. Excellent. Okay, okay so it was, I, I don't, I'm not a part of these discussions. I just show up and they're like, oh yeah, we're pulling the whole thing. <laughs> That's that healer shit right there. Yo. All right. Uh, let's see. Up next, we have question for Yoda. Uh, so this one's from at Gur, who asks, how hard was it to play with a whole new team and how quickly did you adapt? That's a good question. I'd say uh, it was definitely made a lot easier because Dorky talks a lot and just does a lot of the work by himself. But most of the, I was mostly just like adjusting to what he already did and then saying, oh, you know, can we maybe change this or we can maybe change that. But he honestly, he did most of the work. So uh, it was pretty easy. I think. Also, I've been playing with these guys for a while on live, so I think we work well together. How what was um, it like not tanking this season? Oh, I really don't like tanking in MDI, by the way. Uh, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad Dorky likes it. I just... I, honestly, I'm used to playing a DPS, and like if I'm not topped, I, usually I'm topped as a DPS, and a, as a tank, you're literally never topped. And then when I'm not topped, I, I'll, I'm un... I'm just a disproportionate amount of my attention goes to my health bar and my healers globals, and it's just not healthy. It's true. It's really hard not to tunnel your health bar when it's like going from ninety to ten percent every global. You know, it's 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 like if you can maintain composure and call everything while your health is doing that, that's a one yeah. in a million quality to have. I'm a dorky during that sanguine depth pull you were talking about, where it went kind of slightly wrong against Echo, and he's just at like three percent health doesn't press meta because he knows he needs it for the next pull and he just like lives and he's at he's oscillating between three and 15 percent health for 20 seconds without ever yeah, pressing geez. his meta it's just like I, yeah, just I definitely would have met it there yeah. i would have met it and probably lost there so yeah. <laughs> what a what a gamer how, how different was the like group dynamic did you, did you notice it was kind of similar when you were playing or was this a, a very oh, different sort of experience i'd say it's a decent amount different mostly because you know, Junkrat doesn't talk, and then yeah. Cryptics, Cryptics talks a lot more during the match than practice. Uh, whereas on what's currently Complexity, I'd say most of the people talk a decent amount of time. Also, I don't know if you've ever played uh, World of Warcraft with Shaqib and Fired Up, but I would say it's uh, impossible to say that playing with them is the same as playing with anyone else. Yeah. True. Fair enough. All right, um, next question is for either of you, so I'll throw it to Growl first, uh, which is, since the team is mostly new to MDI. How difficult was it to multi-class at that level? So I guess maybe this is not, not appropriate for Growl, who did zero multi-classing. <laughs> and also, uh, in halls, you know, Junkrat, Shadow Priest, Yoda sub. Any reason for that versus Junkrat on sub, since that's what they play on live? And again, this question's from at Dayton Chen. Um, so. Um, so every... It's hard to describe, but every dungeon is its own thing. Like, it seems like it's multi-classing, but really it's like, okay, you're in halls. This is what you do in halls. Like, this is our comp. This is our route. Everything is so hammered out that the idea of multi-classing isn't really there because, like, you know, this is just what you do in this dungeon is you're just this class. Like, we never, uh, at least, like, from the other guy's perspective, too, like, they didn't practice all these other specs in these dungeons. Like, okay, this is, you know, this is theater. Yoda plays Hunter. Like, there was no Yoda Rogue in theater or Yoda Winwalk. Walker, you know, so I think that's like what we were used to in the dungeons. And JR, like, the, I mean, they both are really good at multi classing, but I think JR just mostly plays Shadow Priest. 
Like it wasn't really about, oh, we need to have JR on Rogue because Yoda's also really good at Rogue. It's more about JR is a lot more familiar with, with uh, Shadow Priest. We did notice that JR did get a lot more procs on Windwalker than Yoda did though. So when we needed the procs, I think... But eventually, I think Yoda learned, and then he he made a new <laughs> character because his character wasn't getting enough procs, so he made a character called Yoda Prox. I think that character showed up in some of the matches too. Yoda, you know, is improving was, his procing. Was Yoda Prox a formidable ally or a nemesis to Junkrat people? <laughs> what was Junkrat people? I think Junkrat people was we. Is that a rogue? Dor yeah, I think Dorky Tep kept trying to get him to make a human rogue and not a dwarf rogue and then eventually Junkrat that was his human rogue's name was Junkrat people I, I think, think it's an I think it's an idol Oh okay no never mind <laughs> Human rogue freaking healers There's man. no way he's like fucking human freaking healers <sighs> All right next question speaking of healers uh is from at Juan Romo who asks uh Kyrian Shaman is being hyped for its damage on live servers but an MDI HPAL completely dominated play for every dungeon slash affix combo. Why is this? Um, a lot of Kyrian Shaman's damage is patty. It's like a one minute, it's like a really short CD AOE button. And so a lot of the damage is just done to like easy pulls that you don't really need the damage. Also, Shaman can only do damage when you're not healing. You like Paladin, you just drop Consecrate and like your rotation does damage, especially single target. Shaman's doesn't. And so in a live key scenario, when like, you know, a lot of the pulls that you have to do are just easy because they're in the way and you don't need to pull that big. You can play Shaman and Blast. Like, for example, Mist, right? You do the maze one pack at a time and you just blast it. But in MDI, when you're pulling huge, you just can't DPS as a Shaman. Like, you're not putting out seven 8k dps as a shaman in those mdi pulls because you're just pulling enormous and you have so many things that you have to do whereas paladin can still do that kind of damage while they're healing but i do think one thing that shaman is cool for is it brings lust and it also brings a really good kick and i think it can enable some comps i don't mean to say that shaman is not we'll never see it in mdi i think it will and it could enable some comps in some scenarios but i don't think you're bringing a shaman for the aoe damage you're bringing it for the lust and the kick in mdi all right, uh, that gets us to the end of our questions. Thanks so much to both of you. Let's start uh, our closing bit here with uh, Yoda. Yoda, where can people find you and, and uh, you know find your content and such? Uh, mostly just stream on Twitch right now. It's Yoda TV on Twitch. And uh, Growl, how about you? Uh, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. All yummy TV. Just look for the Waffle Cat, and that's where you'll find me. All right, thanks so much for coming on our show. That is the end of this week's show. We'll be back next week with another one. Good luck in Global Finals to both of you. And yeah, later, everybody. GG's. Bye. Thanks for having us.